It's a challenging time for our National Health Service in England. We're experiencing a huge reorganisation of how care is commissioned, and the Francis report on Mid Staffordshire highlighted systemic problems that it is feared may not be isolated to just that trust. My name is Abigail Warren. I'm an improver working for Halo, an improvement organisation in the English NHS. Hello. I'm passionate about improving health and healthcare, and that's why I'm making this film. I'm convinced that healthcare workers are committed to providing the best possible care for their patients. It's widely accepted that the best way to do this is to have patient-centred healthcare. But I'm curious, how difficult is this to achieve? In England, we've tried to incentivise organisations nationally to deliver improvement by working across organisational boundaries to achieve patient-centred care. Translating the goal of patient-centred care into a meaningful incentivisation scheme is difficult and many have challenged this approach and especially its use of a prevalence measure to measure improvement over time. I think the problem you've got with focusing on prevalence is the focus has shifted down the wrong way. It would be great if there was some sort of incentivisation to have cross-organisational collaboration. But the way that the sequin framework has been implemented is about targets for individual trusts. So um, it's difficult to understand how on the ground the target for the individual trust is going to promote cross-organisation working. You know, people talk about, well, we inherited this from you and you're sending this out to us and it becomes divisive. It's not, it, it's almost anti-collaboration. I'm fortunate to be going to the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare in London and I'm on a mission. I'm going to take the challenges I'm hearing from organisations and frontline staff about the reality of trying to organise measurement and improvement work across the whole health economy to the forum to see what I can learn from global improvement leaders and delegates that share my passion from across the world. Good morning! Hello, lovely! Here are my wonderful teammates, Elsa and Steve. Would you like to say hello? Good morning, Abigail. Welcome Good morning, Abigail. Thank you very much. Very creative. <laughs> Now I've arrived at the forum and met my colleagues, I'm eager to start by getting improvement leaders' thoughts on why we need patient-centred care. One of the core ideas in modern views of quality is you design work around the person you're trying to help. The other thing that you were talking about, there's, there's something about a mind shift in you know, walking in the patient's shoes. A patient um, has harm happen to them and they're not the least bit interested about where it happened. They don't see the boundaries and the silos that we see. The patient's needs don't stop at a particular door. So we clearly have to work across boundaries. So patients experience our healthcare as a whole system. They experience a care pathway, whereas we organise ourselves in organisations, in directorates, in departments. That's no good for patients. I think what we often get to these kinds of situations where people see their responsibility is stopping at a particular door, and I can see why that happens. So designing healthcare that's truly patient-centred means we're going to tear down walls. We're going to, we're going to think differently about our own work, and especially think about interconnections so it's the only way to have high quality. So it's clear that we have to organize our services around patients and not organizations but how can we really do this in practice? How do we have a really patient focused system? Mm. There is no body I've ever met that works in healthcare that isn't every day trying to protect patients from the heart. They doesn't genuinely believe that that is a whole system problem, but they're in this transactional role often where they have to deliver something and they have responsibility for that and they have chains around that which mean that they sometimes disconnect from purpose. It's got to be harder than it sounds. I think it's really hard actually. I think, I think it's really hard and it's the probably the biggest question out there. I suppose um, one of the things that, that strikes me in what you've said is that there's, you know, there is a difference between the rhetoric and the practice and, and so in, in my terms there's a difference between the story that people live and the story they tell. Well, I think it's less to do with organisations than, than it is to do with individuals. It's about building the personal relationships, so the network is about person to person, not organisation to organisation. My cup of coffee behind it. <laughs> I'm not responsible for a harm that happened down the road. You yes. can't try and say that I am. So what would your kind of response be to that? 
Well, it's a leadership um, challenge. So somebody, so somebody says, well, that's not fair to hold me accountable. Well, there are two problematic words in that sentence, fair and accountable. We're not, it's not a fairness issue. It's a, it's a fun issue. It's an ambition issue, which is wouldn't you like to be part of something larger than yourself? Wouldn't you like to think then about the boundaries that make you say, oh yeah, I think I can help with that. And accountability, this isn't about accountability. This is about improvement. And people in leadership positions need to help people to see that, you know, if you talk about them down the road uh, and uh, think that you are doing things a whole heap better, actually you'll get a worse result for patients. Just a second, I need to, there was something I wanted to say. Um, okay. It's about understanding your current work and where you understand the value streams and where the transitions are in those value streams, then I think it allows you then to apply the same principles. We need to build leaders who understand that there are systems and not silos. I think we have to network and build partnerships because we often um, think that we're managing just our own bit and you talk about the whole economy or health economy, I, I think you need to define that and have people who work across that. And then I, I think that you need to build a knowledge base that gets us from where we are to, to there. Yeah, the, the change in thinking that we're trying to convey is that as thought leaders have been saying since the 1970s, patients really are, no kidding, the most underused resource. What you fundamentally got to do is to get the leaders of these organizations in the same mental space and, and, and working to, to an ethical concept of what's the right thing to do. So Jason Leeds from NHS Scotland. So uh, <laughs> this is Pedro Delgado who's the vice president or something or other for half the world at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So principally Latin America, everything Spanish speaking, a little bit of Europe. Is that about right? Asia, oh, Singapore, oh, Of New course, Zealand. my mistake. Yeah, Another yeah. half of the world. <laughs> Clinical staff, patients and um, people from the community, you know, standing together and working through our shared purpose that really, I think, creates the foundations for, for making the change across the system. Your film is uh, probably looking at the aspiration of making it happen everywhere, but uh, we can't under underemphasize the importance of what happens at the local level. And you as an individual are a change agent to get that started. I think that's a really good message. And the truth is, is that it's our burden to find our path to the patient, to find our way to the patient, not to build more complex navigation systems. That's not what it's about. Maybe one of the alternative strategies sometimes is view it as a partnership between the clinical team and the patients. Jason will have much more comments. I hope you have translation uh, Only because, simultaneously. Because I've had more time to think. <laughs> well, you've been answering. So I, I think you're tackling the question from the wrong end. So, so patient voice at an organisational level is, is, is not the means to get to the end. The, the means, I think, is patient voice at the individual consultation or co-production level. So if you can get the financial structures in place and also um, information structures, so patients actually owning their own medical record and carrying it around with them and allowing people to access it as they need to, I think those two things might, might help, but I don't underestimate the challenge. I've heard ideas about how we can achieve patient-centred care and recognition that this will be challenging. Now I'm curious to better understand how we can measure improvement across the health economy. I want to explore prevalence and incident reporting. I spoke to my colleague Kate about this before the forum. This is Kate, Hello. my favourite information analyst. The only one you've got, Abigail. <laughs> you're not the only one, you're my favourite. So privilege measure is really the only practical way that we can do that. Um, we, you know, in an ideal world, we'd want to follow the patient around, but unfortunately we just don't have the systems that enables us to track um, individual patients through their entire journeys. Um, at the moment, I mean, we won't in the future. That's not to say there aren't ways of doing it more accurately, given more resource, um, and we're obviously keen to explore those. But for the moment, it's good, and it's the best we've got. So that's why we like it. <laughs> it's about understanding harm and measurement from the patient perspective. So you're comfortable measuring that kind of Absolutely. Yeah, it's how you learn what's going on in the whole system. So why you might measure prevents across the whole um, 
in the health community, um, for people to make a, feel they can make a difference in that, they have to have some influence over that measurement. So you may only be able to have some influence over your organisation, but if you frame it as what your organisation or what your ward or what your unit is doing as part of the whole, so break it down into their, their bits, then they should be able to see where they can influence that. So to me, the learning, the NLR, and all of the self-reporting systems are more a measure of culture than just about everything else. If they are not used, what does that tell me? So it's about setting the right climate within which information is transparent and available and can flourish. And it's going to happen. We are on the threshold of an information revolution. This information will be out there. So we need to get our heads around how we use it positively to support improvement. So we'll need a pragmatic approach to measurement that's focused on the patient and transparency of data is key. But how should we use this data? As we've seen, there are challenges when using data linked to money to incentivise organisations. So I want to explore this a bit further. I think the incentives are a bit of a challenge actually. You know, the tariffs and the, um, the, the politics and the drivers of the last few years have really pushed foundation trusts to be very insular and commissioners to be very adversarial in my experience. So you, you get the situation where different organisations are, are almost um, inadvertently competing against each other. Are you filming now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's about shared accountability. It's um, it's not always about what monetary incentives there are, but actually what patient incentives there are. So what do our patients want and how do we achieve for our patients? So if you're working across a health economy, it's up to the commissioners in some respects to bring everybody to the table to ensure that everybody's got the same shared agenda. Uh, so I agree it helps to incentivise this uh, um, cross-boundary working. What counts for me is what's going on in the hospital, but I have to understand what's going on in the rest of the health economy. I think, I think more work probably needs to be done on how to make it appear fair. To say you know that there's a nursing home that's giving you lots of harm, that's coming into your trust, is there an incentive okay. there or are you only bothered about what happens in your organisation? Well, again, there's a fair point in that organisations have organisational responsibilities, statutory responsibilities that they must meet. The job of leadership though is to be able to see where some of those rules that are man-made rules get in the way of doing the right thing and to recreate the rules in a way that's more appropriate. Dead easy to say, dead difficult to do, but actually that's what we need to do as our kind of noble purpose and as finance people we won't be able to kind of lay our hands on patients and help them in the way a doctor and nurse can but it's our job to understand what they're doing in order that we can make sure that the, the processes are the best they can be. I mean, anything that uses <coughs> money to drive behaviour creates a disincentive at the same time as it creates an incentive. So I, I would think that it's, it, it's not a bad thing to do, but it's not going to solve things. There's two kinds of motivation. Extrinsic, which comes from outside, and intrinsic, which comes from your own heart and your own soul. Only one of them really is reliable, and that's intrinsic motivation. And the right leadership for improvement draws on what we all want to do, which is a good job with each other. When we start using carrots and sticks as the primary tool for improvement, we're giving up the biggest resource we have, which is people's hearts. I've learnt that the real key to achieving a patient-centred healthcare system is leadership and culture. In order to have true transformation, we need to use intrinsic motivations and engage hearts and minds. We know that incident reporting is a good measure of culture, however over the last two years we seem to be seeing a drop in the proportion of organisations submitting to our national reporting and learning system. I wonder, has the removal of some extrinsic motivators with the message from the government around localisation and the closing of the strategic health authorities led to a decrease in organisations reporting incidents? If so, what does this mean? Is there any place for national incentives as a driver of cultural change? It will be difficult to get the balance right, but I have learnt from this forum that we have the knowledge, the skills and the will to drastically improve the NHS and healthcare globally, with the opportunity to learn from those who have achieved excellence at home and across the world. I have been humbled by the time global leaders have taken to talk to me about this issue, and have been inspired by the commitment from so many to sharing and learning together. I can't wait to see and hopefully be a part of this work to improve our NHS, and ensure that our patients are truly at the heart of all that we do.
what was your quote about I drew a circle? Oh yes. Yeah. Um, oh, it's a poem by. Um, uh... Uh, it's a poem by Edward Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. One of the sessions I did this week was highlighting the work of a fellow by the name of Francis Peabody. And Peabody, back in the early 1900s, taught medical students that the secret of caring for the patient is caring for the patient.